Hello to chapter 76 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville and this chapter is titled The Battering Ram. Ear quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you, as a sensible physiologist, simply particularly remark its front aspect in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling but not the less true events perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of his head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose, and that what nose he has, his spout hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead, blind wall without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme, lower, backward, sloping part of the front he of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone. And not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development. So that this whole, enormous, boneless mass is as one watt. Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil. Yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head. But with this difference. About the head, this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness, inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon, the sharpest land started by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horses' hoofs. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indian men chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks, what do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them at the point of coming contact any merely hard substance like iron or wood, no. They hold there a large, round wad of toe and cork enveloped in the thickest and toughest of oxhide. That bravely and uninjured takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken hand spikes and iron crowbars. By itself this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at. But supplementary to this it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction and 
As the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface and anon swims with it high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of its head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical, lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, unendurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims, behind it all, a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect so that when I shall hereafter detail to you all these specialties and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity and be ready to abide by this, that though... The sperm whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific. You would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow, for unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth. But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials then? What befell the weakling youth lifting the dread goddess's wheel at lies? This was chapter 76. Bye-bye. Till next time. With chapter 77 titled The Great Heidelberg Tongue.